everyone! Today I want to talk about all of the books that I read in August. August was honestly not a super great reading month for me. I read things that I disliked, I read things that I thought were okay, I read a couple things that I really enjoyed but nothing was mind-blowing, which is kind of how I would describe my reading year as a whole. I've read a lot of things that are good that I have liked, but I haven't read a lot of things that I've really loved and really been attached to, which is it is tough because I feel like I should be better at picking books for myself by now, but um, unfortunately no. I'm gonna go over all the books that I read in the month of August from least favorite to favorite, and bear in mind that I don't have all of these books here with me because I got several out from the library or listened to them on audio. The first thing I want to talk about, my least favorite read of the month, was The Elephant Vanishes by Haruki Murakami, which is really really disappointing. This collection came out in 1993, so it is Large, it largely consists of Murakami's works from the 80s and early 90s, which is something that I probably should have known before going into it because I, I don't tend to really like a lot of Murakami's super early work. I know Norwegian Wood came out in the late 80s, but I feel like that's an exception to the rule because I really loved that novel when I read it at the time, but I really struggled with a lot of the things that he also wrote around the same time. I had really high expectations for what Murakami's short stories could be because I think that short stories can really lend themselves well to magical realism, but these just addressed so many similar themes that the, the, the differences in plot quirks that there may have been have totally faded in memory and I just remember feeling kind of bored and frustrated by how repetitive these stories felt and the lack of distinction between them. I wasn't even reading them back to back, but I'm finding this collection to be really tedious and I don't know if I've just grown out of his writing or, or just don't enjoy it anymore and I'm also kind of afraid to go back to some of the books that I really loved of his because I'm afraid of not loving them anymore. Perhaps his other short stories will work for me better. And I say this because I've read a couple of short stories of his in his other collection, Blind Willow Sleeping Woman, and I really enjoyed them when I read them in college, so I do still have hope. But when I say that these stories felt tedious or monotonous, it's not in like the fun Murakami way that, that he has repeating themes and ideas in all of his novels, because I also really enjoy that. Um, I look for those things and like seeing them come up again and again, but to me these stories just didn't feel like they were super unique. I don't know, maybe I was just reading them at the wrong time, but I found it to be kind of a slug and I didn't actually finish all of the stories because I didn't want to. So maybe there were some gems at the end, but I was just very fatigued by this and did not even want to finish it, so I didn't. Another disappointing book is one that was my August Book of the Month Club pick. I no longer have it, but it was A Fierce Kingdom by Jen Phillips, and I picked this because I'd heard that it was a really unique and, and captivating thriller. And I'm not the biggest thriller reader, you know that if you know my channel, but I do like them from time to time and I decided to give this one a go. It was the one that appealed to me the most out of the August selections, so it was either picking that or skipping, and I probably should have skipped. The, the, the failings and fears kingdom to me are, I think are mostly in the writing and the structure of the novel, because the concept is what drew me in. It's a mother and a son, um, her son's a toddler, probably two or three years old, and they frequently go to the zoo together. So they're at the zoo one afternoon, it's about to close, they're heading toward the entrance, and and a shooter comes in and mows down several people in the area. So the mother grabs her son and they run and flee back into the zoo and the novel covers the course of several hours where there's the active shooter in the zoo and the mother is trying to protect her son. And perhaps it's just false advertising, but the way that I understood this novel was that it was all about the claustrophobia of this one setting and the suspense and tension built within this confined space. And that sounded really appealing to me and, and it did sound unique. However, the biggest flaw in this book is that it doesn't just follow the mother and son. There are actually several other narrative perspectives we follow, other people that are in the zoo, including the shooter himself. And I feel like that just really failed me as a reader. And it failed the story because all of that claustrophobia and, and suspense and tension that was built up was totally lost whenever we shifted perspectives. And they were used so infrequently, so sporadically even, that I didn't feel connected to any of those characters. It did not care about them. And it pulled me out of the, the story and the suspense that had been built. And I think that that really failed the story. And that it had only followed like this one mother trying to protect her son, that would have been a lot more suspenseful. That would have led to a lot more unknowns, right? Like we wouldn't know who the shooter was or what their motivations were, or if there was anyone else hiding out in the zoo like her, and whether or not they were alive or dead. And, and those kinds of unknowns and questions add to the suspense. And I don't understand why she chose to do what she did, but it really kind of ruined the story for me. And I honestly didn't find it to be much of a page turner at all. So I can't really recommend it to people who like thrillers or don't and just like to dabble like me. I, I won't, I wouldn't recommend it to pretty much anyone because it 
totally failed in what I think it was attempting to do. And ultimately, I think that it's going to be forgettable. I've already kind of forgot what happened, so that's not really a good sign. Another book that I unfortunately don't remember very well and has not stayed with me, which is why it's appearing so low on this list, was Gather the Daughters by Jenny Melamed. This is a cult novel uh, in that it deals in cults, not that it is, has a cult following, um, but it's a novel that deals in, in, in a cult. It's a very reclusive society, very much in, about suppressing its people, but mostly suppressing its women. We follow four young women who are kind of on the brink of this really weird coming of age ritual that they do where they marry off daughters who have hit puberty. The key thing about this society is that it's it's completely insular. So no one except for a very select few are allowed to leave and they are allowed to leave just to gather supplies from what they describe as the ruins of the world. So it's totally uninhabitable out there. There's no other people out there, but there are some scouts who go gather supplies and remnants from the fallen world and bring it back into the society. A lot of the beginning of the novel is just kind of establishing the rules of the society and introducing you to four, I think it's four young women who, who live in this, this culture and, and the hardship that they deal with and how they begin to rebel against it because they don't really want to get married when they're like 13, 14 and don't, don't like the system and distrust the system as you can imagine that's kind of where the story goes from there but for i found it impactful at the time and i cared about the characters and perhaps that was because i read it within 24 hours but also because i read it so quickly i might be one of the reasons why it hasn't stayed with me because i wasn't with these characters for as long as i was with some of the other ones i've talked about um i don't know i was really captivated by it at the time but like i said it just hasn't really stayed with me in the same way i don't remember any of the characters names for instance or or a lot of specifics about them it's kind of all blurred together so i did enjoy it as a story but it didn't leave any lasting impact on me. So I, I did enjoy it for what it was. It was like a fun summer read in a, you know, kind of dark cult way, maybe like like what The Girls was last year. It just unfortunately didn't leave very much of an impression on me. So I don't know if I could fully recommend it, but it was okay. Next, I want to briefly talk about Bluettes by Maggie Nelson. It is a nonfiction collection of vignettes, um, like 200-ish thoughts about or kind of related to the color blue. Um, Maggie Nelson proclaims to be in love with the color blue and wants to explain her love, but she also ties it into a lot of a lot of theory of, of colors and, and scientific theory about how we see colors, but also more philosophical ideas about colors and their meanings and their impacts. And she also weaves it into this, this story of a relationship that she had with a man. I read this and was intrigued by it because I loved The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson, which I read, I guess, two years ago now. I listened to it on audiobook and it's something that I would love to revisit because I think I would get a lot out of reading it in physical form. I think I would flag a lot of things. And this too, I did flag several passages it's not like it was a total bust, but I just didn't connect with what she was writing about in the same way. The reasons I love the Argonauts is that, first of all, it was fascinating, but it was also very challenging, intellectually challenging, in sort of an academic way. She tied in a lot of literary theory and philosophy, and while there is like an inherent pretension to that sort of writing, it's something that I really got on with. And this has a similar kind of pretension in its writing, but I just understood, I think, less of what she was trying to say, and therefore I struggled with it more. I liked the parts that she was talking about color the most, but she ties in a lot of stuff about this, her relationship and deviates from the central idea of, of it being all about the color blue enough that I, I just would disconnect from those moments more. Here's an example of a vignette, it's vignette number two. And so I fell in love with a color, in this case, the color blue, as if falling under a spell, a spell I fought to stay under and to get out from under in turns. And so yeah, it's it's sort of about that and sort of not, and I, I just think it was a little more scattered, maybe inherently based on the its form. So I, I connected with it less, but I still really, really enjoy Maggie Nelson and would love to read more of her stuff because I just love her brain and the way that she just thinks about things. So I would recommend The Argonauts. If you didn't like The Bluettes as much, I would still recommend The Argonauts. And if you didn't like The Argonauts very much, perhaps you'll get on better with Bluettes, I don't know. She's just such an interesting writer. This is a very interesting book. Um, and I, I'm gonna hold on to it because first of all, it's beautiful. But secondly, it did make me think a lot. And I do think that there are things that are worth chewing on, ideas that she explored in here. Next is a book that I wish that I had loved. I wanted to love very much so much so that I pre-ordered it months ago and read it right when it came to my door because I was so excited about it because there's been nothing but universal praise for it on booktube. Perhaps that was a kind of self-sabotage, I don't know, but anyway, it's Tin Man by Sarah Winman. And don't get me wrong, 
I did enjoy this book, but it was not a five star read for me and I can't give it the glowing praise that it's been receiving from basically everyone else because I just felt emos emotionally distant from it in a way that I struggled to articulate. Perhaps part of that is just in the, the novel's form. It's a kind of two halves of one story, one of Ellis and one of his friend Michael, and, and you don't really get to ever see them together, you just hear of their relationship after the fact. It takes place in the 1980s in the UK. It's about multiple relationships. Ellis's relationship to his mother, his relationship to his wife, and his relationship to Michael mostly are the ones that are explored. But also very largely and emotionally delves into the AIDS crisis um, and, and how devastating that was. But there just was something about the story, and I think perhaps it was the length in the form that I just felt distant from it in a way that I, I wanted to bridge. I wanted to feel connected. I wanted to like open mouth sob while reading this book, which, which is what I kind of felt like I'd been promised because I have not, the book has not made me cry in a long, long time. And I really wanted this book to break that dry spell, but unfortunately it just didn't. And I wanted it to so badly. Like I read the first little section, which is about Ellis's mother acquiring a Vincent van Gogh print and it's such a triumph in her life and she loves this print, the sunflower print, so much. I loved the feeling that that, that part gave me and I thought that, that this book would give me that feeling the whole way through, but something was lost and I wish I knew what it was because I think it was, I think it was the form because it's a relatively non-linear story and you, you don't get to see a lot of the growth in the relationships, you just get to see a lot of aftermath and so therefore it feels like a lot of exposition in relationships that have already kind of felt fallen away or ended for some reason or another and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing and I think that it could have worked but for some reason to my dismay it did not work for me even though I wanted it to so so badly so I, I can't give it glowing praise but I did really enjoy it I gave it four stars it's not like it was it was bad it just won't be on my favorites list of the year unfortunately another book that I really enjoyed not quite five stars was A Guide to Being Born by Ramona Acevedo this is a really interesting short story collection because I had assumed that it was all magical realism, but it's actually a combination of magical realism and realist short stories. And I found myself enjoying the realist stories more. Um, and the fact that I didn't enjoy all of the stories, there was some that I didn't really connect with at all and don't really remember, is the reason why I couldn't give this collection five stars because there are some winning stories in here, but there are only a handful. And it was more concepts that I struggled to connect with than the writing. The writing was, was stunning. After three or four short stories, I actually went ahead and added Ramona Asimov's novels to my to-read shelf because I really love her writing. I really connected to it. For instance, Poppy Seed, which is the second story in the collection, I loved. It's about a, a parent's relationship to their daughter who is developmentally disabled, and so it's kind of individually about their relationships to their child and their relationship to parenthood, but also it's their relationship to one another as co-parents, and I really loved that story. And there was another one called Atria, which I really, really loved. That again was a totally realist short story, which was about a teen pregnancy. Just the way that she deals with some of these concepts the, the realist ones in particular, I loved so much. And I love that this whole collection kind of centers on, on relationships, but particularly within the female body. So it's birth, gestation, but also love and romance. But the biologically female body is kind of the central theme connecting all these stories so that they're not really connected in terms of, of story elements, but they're connected in terms of that overarching theme which I thought was really, really unique and cool, and I would love to read more of her stuff. So it wasn't my favorite short story collection ever, but it was really, really good, and I'm very happy to have read it. Another thing that was a surprise for me in a really good way was Let Them Eat Chaos by Kate Tempest. This is a spoken word poetry album that I opted to listen to on Spotify because it was available for free, although you could read the physical collection itself. I listened to the album, first of all, because it was free, but secondly, because I love spoken word, and I really wanted to hear how it was arranged, not only in terms of how Kate Tempest herself reads the words, but also how the the poetry was put to music, which in this case it was. So interesting the choices that she made were and how well they flowed into one another, and it was a really enjoyable experience. I do think I would get a lot out of listening to it again a couple of times, and maybe even reading the physical collection, because obviously I couldn't really latch onto some of the, the phrases as, as well as I could have if I was reading it physically, because they left so quickly, but there was a power in hearing her speak these words, and I also loved the concept behind the album, which I didn't know before listening, but it is a through-line story, and it focuses specifically on a, an apartment complex in London, and all of the individuals in the apartment complex get their own narrative, and we get to hear different social issues that they're facing, different personal issues that they're facing, all in a specific pinpoint moment in their lives. It's 4.18 in the morning, and um, 
that, that phrase is repeated over and over again and we get to see all of their lives snapshot in this one particular moment in a, like a post-Brexit London. Um, I thought it was really fascinating. I would love to read more of Kent, Kate Tempest's stuff. I loved how political this was. I loved the messaging behind it. I thought it was beautiful. It surprised me in a lot of ways. Um, it just reminded me how I really enjoy spoken word. And I think I enjoyed it more than other poetry that I've read this year so far, partially because it was read by the author themselves. And I really enjoyed that. Another thing I really enjoyed listening to this month was a nonfiction book that I heard about on the All the Books podcast a few months ago called Reading with Patrick by Michelle Kuo. It's almost a memoir, but I feel like it's a little more nonfiction than memoir. But it's about Michelle Kuo's experience. After college, she joins Teach for America and is located in rural Arkansas, and her experience witnessing firsthand the abject poverty of the students that she's teaching and how desperate and how how underfunded the program she's working in is and how it changed her perspective but also changed her as a person. She, the first, I'd say third of this book is her experience working as a teacher and eventually she leaves teaching, goes to law school, um, but she focuses specifically on her relationship with a student named Patrick and how he just had so much promise but she didn't feel like she wanted to stay in Arkansas forever. Um, so she felt sort of like she betrayed her students by leaving, but she did it for herself. And a few years later, she learns that Patrick has been arrested for murder, and so she feels obligated to return to Arkansas and learn about Patrick's story, but also help him improve his literacy and his reading comprehension skills while he is in prison waiting, awaiting trial. And what was really interesting to me is that Michelle feels like she could connect to her students by sharing with them things like the Civil Rights Movement and the writings of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. and, and classics written by black authors. But they struggle to connect with these things, firstly because of reading level, but secondly just because their lives are so focused on just survival that they can't really expend the mental energy learning about history or the implications of history. Um, they don't really connect to it because it doesn't immediately impact them because everything that they really need to focus on are things that immediately impact them. That is how poor they are, that's how much they are struggling. Um, and she, so she learns about a lot about life and poverty in that way, but also how to connect with students in, in ways that she didn't expect because she thought that they would immediately gravitate toward the civil rights story, but they just didn't because it didn't impact them the same way. And they didn't understand the flow of history and how the way that their lives are now was directly impacted by the civil rights movement and systemic racism and the prison industrial complex but they just couldn't connect to those ideas so she had to learn how to to get through to them in a different way and that was a really interesting journey to follow how she used literature to connect with them so i really enjoyed this as a story she tells it much better than i do although i don't know if i would necessarily recommend the audiobook because she does read it herself and she isn't the best reader i've ever heard but i still got a lot out of her story and it made me think about things in different ways. It's a part of the country that I've never experienced. It's a level of poverty that I've never experienced. So I feel like I learned a lot personally from it um, and got a lot out of her story. So I would definitely recommend it. It's called Reading with Patrick by Michelle Kuo. I have two more things to talk about. I'm just gonna talk about the fifth season briefly because I've already read it. It's a book that I read and reviewed back in January. So if you wanna know my thoughts about it, I'll link that video because it is one of my favorite books of the year so far. And I wanted to reread it so I can jump right into the obelisk gate, which I'm hoping to do next week. I feel like Maybe something was a little bit lost in the second reading, I don't know, I'm hesitant to say that because it took me a really long time to get through. I was traveling and doing other things so I didn't devour it like I did the first time. So my momentum was not consistent. And I'm very, very much looking forward to reading The Obelisk Gate and seeing where the story goes. The last thing that I want to talk about, also briefly because I don't have it here, it's a graphic novel so it's kind of hard to talk about it without the physical object, is The Encyclopedia of Early Earth by Isabel Greenberg. This is also a graphic novel that most people have already read, so if you haven't yet, I'll briefly describe the plot. It takes place in a world called Early Earth. We focus on these two individuals. They're on separate boats and they kind of drift toward one another and they fall in love um, from a distance. It's a very like folklore-y, fairy tale type of story. So they fall in love, but they can't touch. They, there's like a physical invisible barrier preventing them from touching. So they have to kindle their romance without physical affection. Um, and one of the main ways they do this is through storytelling. One of the, the individuals is a storyteller. And so you get to hear all of his stories that he's been telling as a nomadic storyteller and also how he got to where he was. And the stories really, really 
elegantly and fluidly flow within in and out of one another and I really enjoyed that. It was also surprisingly funny which for some reason I wasn't expecting but it was very funny, very cute and clever. I loved the art style which unfortunately I can't show you but hopefully I can put some image on the screen so you can get a sense of the artwork but I really really enjoyed it. I guess I got it from the library so I was reading kind of a grubby really well loved copy but I would love to have one of my own and read the other book that she came out with either this year or last year which was um which is 100 Nights of Hero because I was very pleasantly surprised by it. I don't know why because everyone loved it so maybe I had my expectations set kind of low so I wouldn't be disappointed and I certainly wasn't. It was adorable. I read it in one sitting and I really loved it. And it's a graphic novel that I would recommend to people who don't normally like graphic novels because the art is very unique as well as, as the storytelling mechanism and it's very whimsical. It feels like a series of folk tales and I really enjoyed that aspect as well. It was really really cute. So yeah I would definitely recommend that. And those are all of the books that I read in August. Here's hoping that September is a better reading month. Right now I'm reading reading Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward and loving it, so I'm really hoping that that can be a five-star read. Right now it totally is. I'm about 75 pages in and I'm really, really loving the story. Her writing is amazing. And yeah, like I said, I'm hoping to read The Obelisk Gate and then probably The Stone Sky after that. And then I don't know what I'm going to read, but hopefully really good things. I hope that I can get some things that I really love in this month. So yeah, other than that, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.